Welcome in, everybody, to Fantasy Pros. This is the Fantasy Football Podcast. It's me, Joey P. Joe P. Zapia. That, of course, is Mike Tagliere, and it's you. And we got a great show for you today, as always. Yesterday, an instant classic. Today, nothing less. This is what we do. Every day, we just pump out these instant classic podcasts and make sure you know that it's not just about listening to them. It's about watching them as well. You can watch the podcast and all their glory over on Fantasy Pro's YouTube channel. Just go to youtube.com slash fantasy pros. Make sure you subscribe as well as click that notifications button because we got a whole lot of content flowing for you on draft stuff. It is almost August. We are in the thick of things right now and we are the place to go for all of your preparation and tags. We got a great guest. We got a great show. 15 high upside running backs and wide receivers. We're going to go digging. And I think this is so important tags because we're always looking for upside. We're always looking for guys who can jump a tier. And to me, this is how you win fantasy leagues. It's not about, oh, how deep I can get somebody off the waiver wire or I know this guy. I think this one person's going to all of a sudden change my league. No, no. It's about consistently looking for value and guys that can go from twos to ones, threes to twos, and so on and so forth. That's the idea, right? Uh, when you draft, you want equity into your picks. You want guys that have have room for more. Obviously, you're not really going to get that in the first round. Some A lot of the times in the second round, you're not going to get that because you're talking about players that are being drafted top six at their position or whatever. Um, but as you go further in the draft, the idea should be to draft a player with equity, oh, someone that can give you obviously a much higher ceiling some of those players come with lower floors and that's why it's important to balance your roster as you go through a draft you can't just draft all upside guys it's going to end poorly i promise you you're going to hit on one or two guys but your roster is just going to be weekly just death so um it's it's definitely an interesting thing where people always want to know who are the upside guys who are this but you have to balance your roster so just because you hear about the 15 guys in the show today doesn't mean you have to go out and draft all of them it just means that these are the guys if you're looking for an upside play someone who's got tremendous equity or like built in but mm-hmm. might also have a lower floor these are the guys you should be targeting I'll speak for yourself i'm gonna draft every single one of them we talked today and you know what forget that list of 15 let's make it 16 because one of my favorite upside picks is our guest today from pro football focus he is also one of the co-authors of the fantasy football black book the number one <laughs> selling fantasy book over on amazon he wrote all of the running back profiles He's a wonderful guy, he's a wonderful analyst, and he's a good friend of mine. He's the one, the only, Andrew Erickson. You can follow him on Twitter at Andrew Erickson underscore. Andrew, welcome to the program. Well, I should say welcome back. It's good to see you, my friend. Yes, it is great to be back here. Love talking it up with you guys, so I'm thrilled. And you know what? I mean, you you got to stick around for the pre-show banter. I got to ask you, you know, do you guys have the same kind of banter or PFF or you guys are just all business in the beginning, not not morons like me and tags, right? <laughs> we usually, you know, we're pretty straight to the point. You get down to business. Yeah. We The banter usually happens after the fact where we'll joke around. But yeah, we we don't joke nearly as much. No, That's usually right. at the end at the end of our show, we usually just get off because we're just like, <laughs> I've had enough of you. I am totally out right now. Tags, I can never get enough of you. I don't know. You are I, so full of crap. I love you. I I told you last <laughs> week I loved you, and it wasn't because you almost died. I love you anyway. But I felt like in case you did, I wanted to make sure you knew that you knew how I felt about you. And we're gonna be spending a lot of quality time together, you and I, my friend. But if you're gonna be spending some quality time in drafts, make sure you are using the draft wizard and specifically the draft assistant with sync because it is absolutely what you're going to need to go into your drafts now draft assistant with sync what that does is it provides advice and pick suggestions to your live online draft in real time you are drafting it's going to connect to your draft and it's basically like having tags in the room to tell you hey don't pick that guy pick this guy and it's going to have me to cheer you up if you make a bad pick or it's going to have me to suggest hey maybe you shouldn't do this but i'm going to do it in a much nicer way than tags would do it but regardless what it's going to be is like basically having us all in the room with you during your draft and it connects to all the sites like Yahoo, ESPN, NFL.com, CBS. So it doesn't matter where you're drafting. We'll be able to help you there. And even has the same interface as the draft simulator. So what you're going to do is you're going to go to fantasypros.com slash draft wizard, but only the MVP and hall of fame level subscribers can access that draft assistant with sync. Now I know what you're saying. Well, you know, I got to upgrade to a premium product, but listen, if you're making big time investments in your fantasy football season, This might be the best investment you can make is to go to fantasypros.com and get that draft wizard because the draft is the foundation. We're here to help you with the podcast. We're here to help you on the site too, but we can't be there with you during your draft unless you're an MVP or Hall of Fame subscriber. And that allows us to really 
literally be there in the room with you. So once again, go to fantasypros.com slash draft wizard and get that draft assistant with sync. It's a fantastic tool. Even tags uses it. <clears throat> and I can only assume it's to have me in the draft with him, right tags? Cause you've, you've made no bones. Every draft you do, you use our products. Well, yes, and it, well, it also gives me you give me a terrible grade most of the time because we. Well, just you don't deserve agree. it most of the time. Obviously, um, no, no, it, it's it's really nice, especially when we talked about the auctions the other day. The auction, mm -hmm. it, it's just so nice. But it's also good to know that you, you draft a team and then you look at it when, when basically a bunch of analysts get together and say, "Hey, this is how we feel about your league and how you drafted." It's always nice to have that. Yeah, in uh, in all honesty, it it really is, and uh, I've seen it in action. It's an incredible tool. But like I said, go over there and check it out yourself over at fantasypros.com slash draft wizard. So today we're gonna do is look at once again half point PPR ADP, and we're gonna go through two running backs each and three wide receivers, guys that we're looking for that can kind of make that little jump. Before we do, I just want to talk a little bit of headlines here because there were a couple things that dropped that I know people have questions about. They're asking us on Twitter or we're just kind of talking about in the fantasy season. The Green Bay reworking Aaron Rodgers contract and Aaron Rodgers is coming to camp and huh, looks like he's going to be a Packer at least this year too. Uh, I mean, it's just so shocking. I just can't even believe it. It's so surprising. It's, it's, it's like it almost came out of nowhere. It feels like, I mean, I know I'm just, you know, got knocked off my chair when I heard this news. Uh, Andrew, your thoughts about Aaron Rodgers being back in camp and looking like he is going to now, you know, be part of the Packers at least for 2021. I think it's just great for Devontae Adams, back as the <laughs> wide receiver one. Yeah. Good for Aaron Jones, back as the top 10 running back. And I think that the ancillary pieces, the Lazards, Valdez, Scantling, Tanyan, become more interesting late round options. Uh, here's a fascinating thing, too, because I think all the early Devontae Adams values now gone. Literally yesterday morning, I got him in the second round of a best ball <laughs> draft. And I had this sense, and I think maybe an, an hour later, this news broke. And I went, well, that's the last time you'll probably see that happen, Tags. Would you agree that's probably it now? Oh, yeah. Devontae Adams back to a first rounder, hands down. Uh, it's not even a question anymore. Now the question is, do you take Tyreek Hill? Do you take Devontae Adams? But me personally, I'll take Adams uh, all day. He's just – he's a if he's on the field, he's performing. That's how it goes. And Rodgers, so the one thing that people should take away from this is that Rodgers apparently has told Green Bay that there were a few things that he, concessions he wanted in order to come back. And one of them was that he wanted Randall Cobb back, which I have no freaking idea why. Um, I know Rodgers is a timing-based quarterback. He relies on relationships, having having to trust where his player is going to be. So maybe that's it, whatever. But Randall Cobb's older. He hasn't played in, in the floor system. I don't know how this is all going to work, but it makes sense now that Houston traded for Anthony Miller last weekend. So now that they have a slot receiver that can kind of plug in that place and then Randall Cobb's probably going to go back to Green Bay which will eliminate Alan Lazard's role I would assume mm -hmm. because Valdez Scantling is the field stretcher you have Devontae Adams possession style receiver Cobb in the slot which also ruins Amari Rogers's value which right. never was going to be great his rookie season because again Rogers takes time to develop the chemistry with his receivers the biggest winner here for me is is Robert Tunyon uh he was someone yeah. that I was I, I was I had him down at like tight end 18 before uh before I knew Rodgers was basically going to come back but now that he's back now sure last year his opportunity dictated that he should have been the number 18 tight end in fantasy football if he had finished tw six spots higher than what his expected fantasy output would have been that would have been tied for the league league six, six spots higher but he finished all the way up at number three so it was an outlier season he was going to regress yes but there's also some career progression here where robert tunyon is another year into his career he has more rapport with rogers he proved to be a reliable target for him caught like 90 percent of the balls thrown to him last year so robert tunyon is definitely back in as a top 10 tight end and i've had i actually put him up at number eight right now might move him to number seven Tunyon also brought a lot of physicality, which I always thought kind of lacked in this offense a little bit. You know, Adams is a physical player, but for the most part, you know, Tunyon, you would see him catch a ball, stiff arm a guy, move somebody, you know, all of a sudden get that big third down pickup. And I think that was always that one thing, that physicality that was kind of lacking in the Packers offense. And he kind of brought that edge to it a little bit, which was very necessary. Also, Logan Thomas gets an extension after his uh, breakout season last year. And the Giants are taking a, quote, long-term approach with Saquon Barkley. Andrew, when you're looking at Saquon Barkley, and obviously he's still first round grade, somewhere in that middle first round can vary anywhere from as high as second overall to all the way sometimes at the very end of the first round, depending on what other people in your league think of Barkley. What do you think of this news, though, with the maybe long term approach kind of working him in slowly? Are you concerned for any slow starts potentially in September for Saquon? Yeah, I, I do think that he's probably going to start the season pretty slow. So whether that's because they limit his workload 
and also you look at the schedule that the Giants have to open the year, it's not favorable for them, especially for the running back position. So Barkley is usually a player, okay, the matchups aren't great. He can overcome it because of a heavy workload. Now that's in question. So I do think it's important to incorporate into your draft strategy. If you are investing a back-end first-round pick or a early second-round pick into Saquon Barkley to have a contingency plan, whether it's a Raheem Mostert, a player that a lot of people are down on because there's a running that's going to potentially you know, take over his starting role. But week one, it looks like he's slated to be the starting running back. So just being prepared, especially as we go into the off or get closer to the start of the year, we still don't get any more answers about if Barkley's going to be available. When they say he has a chance to play week one, that's kind of um, like that, that does concern me a little bit. You don't say you have a, a chance of doing something. It's like, I have a chance to win a million dollars, but that doesn't mean I'm going to like, like it's, it's, it's more pessimistic than optimistic is at least the way that I view it. So I think it's just, it's smart to be prepared. Look at Devonte Booker as your last pick, just grab him. So you have a body that you can at least throw in. Okay. He'll get RB three or RB two production. You know, the first couple of weeks I have Booker, at least I can use. So I think, I don't think you should fade Barkley in any way, shape or form, especially because he's falling in drafts because I think the value as a top three running back talent that he is I think that's worth scooping up but it's just important to make sure that you make the necessary draft moves along with Barkley as one of your top picks and of course you can always cut Booker two weeks into the season if things start to go the other direction and Saquon looks healthy and good but this is why preseason is important for some players not all players but what's important for everybody is upside so let's get after it and let's talk about some of those running backs first uh is there a late running back one or running back two that has a chance to kind of outperform their ADP, maybe jump a tier. And who is that guy for you? Andrew, you're our guest. Let's start with you on this one. It's, it's Joe Mixon. I think that this one is pretty easy for me to look at. You look at the potential workload, the volume that he's going to get in this offense. They've talked about using him on all three downs. And that's not hyperbole. That's not just coach speak because they literally did that yet last year when he was healthy. You know, average 23.3 touches per game, which was the fourth most among all running backs. And that was while Giovanni Bernard was still involved in the offense. So you how now have a potential for him to see an expanded workload in the passing game. And a lot of people point to Mixon's poor efficiencies, yards per carry last year, 3.6 was not great, but he didn't have any breakaway runs. Like that's mm-hmm. really the reason why his yards per carry was so down. And breakaway runs are not really a sustainable stat year over year. 2018 and 2019, Mixon ranked second and fourth in rushes of 15 plus yards. Hmm. So he bangs out a couple more explosive plays. He's going to see lighter boxes because of the receiver threats on the outside with Joe Burrow. So yeah, I think Mixon is an easy candidate to pass his RB13 ADP just because of the, the touches. I know Tags has talked a lot about this with Najee Harris specifically. It's, it doesn't matter that the offensive line is bad. Like It matters that he's going to get volume, so I like Mixon a lot. And with those three wide receivers, certainly a lot for defenses to handle, which should theoretically, like you said, kind of open up the door for more big plays. Great stat there, year over year, Mixon of the big plays there. Well done. See, that's why I like having you on, because <laughs> you always drop those stat nuggets like that. We love the nuggets here on the show. Uh, let's get some more nuggets from Tags. Who's that first RB you want to talk about in that RB1 or RB2 range that can really kind of move up and Someone not named Najee Harris, please. I'm not going to do what everybody thinks I'm going to do. And <laughs> I'm not going to do that. No, no. In, in reality, I did not put Najee Harris here because I think people are sick of hearing me talk about him. So I'm actually going to say Clyde Edwards-Alaire. And I think Edwards-Alaire probably has more upside than Najee Harris. Harris is probably going to finish as a top eight running back. I don't know if he gets to top three just because of the efficiency behind that line. You know, that's what can hold him back from like top tier production. Clyde Edwards-Alaire is still the running back that you drafted in the first round last year. He still has first round. Uh, he was still a first round draft pick he's still in a high scoring offense he's still a three down running back this offense still has a history of producing RB1s they didn't replace Le'Veon Bell the guy who started taking touches away from him for whatever reason and honestly even if you go into the Super Bowl when we when we saw the Chiefs there it was like they came out and they it was a Andy Reid failed to adapt. He, he, he right. failed to adapt um, as the game was going on. I don't know if it was due to the things that were taking place off the field with his son or whatever, but basically they came out after halftime and it was like, all right, we re- re- regrouped. We're going to try and run the ball. It was too late at that mm-hmm. point. They need to get back to the run. I understand Patrick Mahomes is, might be the best quarterback that we've ever seen play the game. I get it. But at the same time, if you don't have a run game to lean on, it's going to cost you if Mahomes doesn't have time, has an off day, whatever the case may be. Clyde edwards Alaire, there's a reason they drafted him. He's going to be heavily utilized in the passing game everything is here it's the recipe to find a top three running back everything points to Clyde Edwards Alaire as that guy so to get him around the RB 15 to RB 18 range that's typically where you see him go it's just theft it's theft and 
you know, just to kind of remind everybody and shake them a little bit, just go back a couple years to where Kareem Hunt was in this offense, right? And he was a pretty darn productive running back, and Patrick Mahomes was still a pretty good fantasy quarterback. So it's not like they're mutually exclusive. Like, all of a right. sudden, well, you can't say, oh, Patrick Mahomes is so good, I can't sustain a running game. Really? Because I remember seeing it not that long ago where you can do that. And balance is good. It's just the thing that the Chiefs kind of lacked a little bit last year, yeah. especially down the stretch. And they did like, rebuild their offensive line, too, and it might yeah. be better than it was last year. Oh, I think it is. I, yeah. I, to be fair, I think it's, it is better. Uh, for me, the first guy I want to talk about, he's running back 19. But he finished RB4 last year. And I understand uh -huh. there were some things. That's right. Let's do this. We're going to do this. Because enough already with the disrespect for David Montgomery. Okay? And I, you know what? Part of the reason I like this so much is because he is being disrespected. He is all the way at RB19. Now, I understand he is not the same caliber talent as the Dalvin Cooks and Christian McCaffreys of the world. And that's fine. He's going to get goal line work. Tariq Cohen already on the pop. Right? And I'm so sick of hearing about Tariq Cohen over and over again with the Tariq Cohen and how he's going to change this and do that. No, no, no. Look, David Montgomery last year caught over 40 balls. He's going to do that again this year, even if Tariq Cohen does eventually get healthy and show up there. And I know they brought in other help and all that stuff. David Montgomery showed you what he needed to show you last year. Yes, he showed it to you against lesser opponents. That's fine. I get it. You're supposed to be good. Good! Be good against guys you're supposed to be good against, and then I'll take my lumps against the tougher defenses, and I'll learn from those mistakes. But look, right now, he is solidly in that RB2 grouping. And this was a guy that finished top five last year. So all I want to say is, let's give him a little bit more respect, and could he get right back into that top 10 conversation? I think it's undoubtedly yes, because the health is there, number one. The quarterback play is better, number two. And number three, he showed you last year all that evolution that you were dying to see in the first year that you didn't get, that you were so unhappy with. Meanwhile, if you dial back two years ago, everybody was super excited for David Montgomery in the NFL, and then all of a sudden everybody wasn't excited anymore last year. And I guess what? Everybody who had him last year on a team was pretty excited where they finished. I can guarantee well, you that. Well, Joe, I, I, I want to I want to yes. combat this one because we haven't talked Please a whole lot about do. David Montgomery on this show. And I feel like I want to spend time on players we haven't talked about. Let's do it. Let's talk about the negatives. The sure. negatives are the fact that off that offensive line is completely rebuilt. They have new t new tackles behind it. You know, mm -hmm. Andy Dalton didn't look very good with the Cowboys last year. Matt Nagy turned into a crap play caller. And yes, Tariq Cohen is... He's coming off an injury, but at the same time, this is a team that paid him a lot of money to play the role that he's playing in this offense. David Montgomery with Tariq Cohen in the lineup, 2.3 uh, 2 targets per game. Without him in the lineup, 4.9 targets per game. That's a massive jump, and that's the reason David Montgomery got up to those 40 receptions. He also had a quarterback that was more susceptible to dumping down. Uh, and, like, just the overall offense altogether. I, it wouldn't shock me if Matt Nagy was fired mid-year. Uh, if, they, if they keep running the same exact playbook that they were running last year, He's going to be fired because they're not going to win a whole lot of games. But it's, I understand, and I, I like Montgomery for this podcast we're doing because I do believe that he's an upside. Because if that offensive line turns better, let's say Bobby Massey and Charles Leno, when, with those guys gone, that the offensive line gets better with Tevin Jenkins there. Let's say that, you know, again, it is a higher scoring offense with Justin Fields or Andy Dalton. Those are good things, but we have to acknowledge that there, there's definitely pros and cons to David Montgomery. Andrew, where do you lie on Montgomery? I want to know just because obviously Joe is really into him. I think he's a fine back-end RB2. That's where I'm at with him. Yeah, that's where I have him ranked as a back-end RB2, and, and I get the upside that Joe's talking about. The one concern that I have is that you kind of hit on it a little bit, Tags, was as the quarterback it, when Justin Fields potentially takes over. So I've done a lot of studies at PFF when looking at mobile quarterbacks and their impact on the running backs in the passing game. And you just see it get neutralized. Like J.K. Dobbins, Damian Harris last year, like mm -hmm. six yards per carry. Oh my God, that's great. But they don't catch any passes. And in formats that reward points for catching receptions, it really takes a toll. Like you think that six yards per carry is enough to like make up ground. And oftentimes it isn't. It's You really actually want the receptions more, especially when games get out of control where one team needs to be super pass heavy. Montgomery's not in the game or he's not getting touches or receptions from... Justin Fields. So that was one of the problems with Trey Sermon in, at Ohio State. Like, Trey Sermon did not catch passes because Justin Fields was the quarterback. So that's mm -hmm. one thing that's a concern. Again, the, the efficiency could go up for Montgomery, which is great. And I think that's at worst going to make him at least finish where he's being drafted. I don't think you're going to draft Montgomery. He's going to finish as, like, an RB3. So I think that he's safe where he's kind of going, and there is room for him to grow. But at the same time, there are some concerns about just the entire offense as a whole. And, and can't forget Damian Williams as well. Like, Damian Williams is a capable pass catcher as well. Nagy if, knows him too. Yeah, so he understands the offense. So is it going to be him and, him 
in third down situations on a two-minute drill. So those are some other concerns with some of the other backs in the backfield. All of your concerns, both of you, are warranted. I think you're both overthinking this one. I think sometimes we have to go back and look at what's going on on the field and what's successful and what's not. And yes, he does have familiarity with the guy that he brought in there, as you mentioned with Williams. But at the same time, I think that what you want to look at is, did this guy who we also have a lot of draft capital invested in, David Montgomery, forget, you know, Tariq Cohn's contract. Let's talk about the future of this team. You know, Tariq Cohn's another year older, too, another year hurt. You know, I mean, it's every year it's the same thing with that guy. I'm telling you right now, I get what you guys are saying. And that's, and I think it's built in, it's cooked in to that RB19 value. But once again, if he cracks that top 10, which I think is really possible when you consider the guys that are ahead of him, there's a lot of things we can also talk about those guys going wrong ahead of him in terms of injury, in terms of returning from injury, in terms of the offense, in terms of their offensive lines. Montgomery showed you he has the upside to do it. And all of a sudden, it's like we want to denounce all, everything that we saw last year, too, which I understand there's a big grain of salt with it. But now I feel like that grain of salt came a boulder, and it's just knocking people over, and it's crushing his value. Top 20 running back, he might be a top 12 running back, and that's what I want to highlight there. Let's go to the second running back here. Is there a guy later for you, Andrew, that you want to take maybe uh, an RB3 that could really kind of get into um, maybe that RB2 territory? Or maybe there's somebody even further down that you can think of that if something happens, all of a sudden this guy could be a really useful fantasy running back if maybe an injury or maybe opportunity presents itself. I really like the rookie that the Denver Broncos selected this year, Javante Williams from North Carolina. I think that with Melvin Gordon entrenched there, it's looking like it's going to be a committee to start the year. But at the same time, you know, Williams has been in a committee his entire college career and he's all he's done and put up monster numbers despite not seeing a full workload. So I anticipate them working in a 60-40 split, kind of how they did last year with Melvin Gordon and Philip Lindsay. So Javante Williams takes on that 40% role while Gordon as the starter, assuming that everything checks out with him. I know that he's had some off-the-field issues. And again, the team invested, traded up to get Williams. Melvin Gordon is a free agent. There are some running back needy teams out there calling out the rant. Like there's a lot of scenarios where Melvin Gordon isn't even on this roster potentially week one. So I think Javante Williams just... He has everything that you'd want in a running back. He can catch passes. He's super explosive. And the crazy stat about him, his ludicrous missed tackle rate, was, <laughs> it, it was insane. It was like almost 50% of his touches, he was forcing a missed tackle at the college level. And it is eerily similar to Antonio Gibson coming out. The only difference was Antonio Gibson did it on like 90 touches and Williams did it on 180 touches. So there's a ton of upside with him. And I think that even if he does work in a split with Melvin Gordon, the coaches are going to figure out sooner rather than later, almost kind of like a Nick Chubb, Carlos Hyde thing where it's like, okay, like every time we give this guy the ball, he like rips off these 20 yard runs. Like let's just keep giving him the ball and not, you know, Melvin Gordon. Like let's feed this guy that we traded up to, to get in the draft. So I like Javante Williams, especially because Denver, I think they're going to run the ball. They were eighth in neutral game skip run rate last season and they have a really good defense. So I think that they want to play closer to the vest. So I think that's a, Javante Williams is really interesting. Shout out to shout out to Andrew for making me remember that Carlos Hyde was a Brown and was taking touches <laughs> away from Nick Chubb. <laughs> that's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. That's that's why. Look, that's, that's you don't think it's a joke that I hire these people to work for me for the Black Book. You think I'm just like pulling names out of a hat? No. It's bright young minds like Andrew Erickson. Before we get to uh, tag second running back, I want to tell everybody about Fantrax. It's the most customizable fantasy platform in the industry, offering the greatest fantasy experience of your dynasty, keeper redraft, or best ball league life. Fantrax's NFL free fantasy football league manager is the most customizable, easy to use, and feature-rich platform in the industry. And if you're coming from another service, that's okay. Fantrax can import your current leagues and customize them too if needed. Fantasy sports doesn't sleep and neither does Fantrax. And the season runs 365 over there. And look, they're customizable platform is really fantastic but that's not all that they have they can run your regular old standard kind of leagues as well but everybody likes to get a little bit more creative shake things up and that's why Fantrax is such a great platform and if you sign up for free today you're entered to win an autographed Josh Allen jersey all you got to do is go to Fantrax.com slash fantasy pros and sign up today again that's Fantrax.com slash fantasy pros Fantrax the home of fantasy sports Let's give a home for another running back on some rosters here. Who's got some later running back upside that you like here tags on your list? 
Well, if Daryl Henderson's still available as an RB3 by the time you do your draft, it's a no-brainer to me. Uh, I have him as my RB17, and uh, that's definitely an upside play. Uh, now, it, you can make the case. You know, we had uh, Joe Dolan on the show uh, mm-hmm. last week, I think, when we that injury broke uh, yeah. Cam Akers. And After he, he took Cam Akers, right, two rounds but he, later. <laughs> but he also said that he would he'd contemplate Daryl Henderson at the top of the second round. That, that, it, that was his immediate reaction. Now, from that time, he may have cooled off just a little bit, but, you know, this is this – if they don't add a big name running back or someone of significance to this roster, Daryl Henderson, they've already talked about the fact that they're not going to play him in the preseason, which tells you they're protecting him. And that's, that's a really good thing for a running back. They don't need reps in the preseason. That's perfectly fine. Uh, but if you want to dig a little deeper and say, okay, we don't know where Henderson's ADP is going to finally you know settle down. Um, there's a couple guys, you know, um, so Trey Sermon is definitely one of them. Um, but I worry about, you know, Andrew was talking about their involvement in the passing game, you know, players like him, players like Ronald Jones, players like Damian Harris, they're all good running backs, but if they're not utilizing the passing game, it's difficult to see them taking that next step, you know, that ascension into RB2 or maybe even RB1 territory. Uh, someone that will get involved in the passing game is Michael Carter. Michael Carter also doesn't need an injury in order to take on a bigger role. You know, Andrew, the guy that you talked about, John Javante Williams, he was in a timeshare because Michael Carter was so damn good. Michael Carter was fantastic. Michael Carter is underrated because Javante Williams was on that same team. And I think we would be looking at both of these players a little bit different, maybe even higher for both of them. If they were able to shine in their own role, um, Michael Carter is behind, the difference is Javante Williams is behind Melvin Gordon, who's, who's proven Tevin to be Coleman. a very good NFL running back. Uh, and then we have Tevin Coleman. <laughs> I mean, do we need to talk about Tevin Coleman no. anymore? We, we know exactly no. who he is. So uh, Michael Carter should have a role to play in your flex almost immediately. And honestly, I, I can't see this going more than like four weeks where they're like, hey, Tevin Coleman is definitely gives us the best chance to win. Let's stick with that guy. No, Michael Carter is one of those defi- those guys that I'm going to have on a lot of my rosters. Sticking with my theme of guys who just don't seem to get any respect no matter what they do on the field, and everybody just hates them for whatever reason. Melvin Gordon? No, no, no that's a good Fournette? one. That's, that's another good one. No, Fournette? I'm going to go even deeper. How about RB50? How about a dart throw on Philip Lindsay? Who every time Philip Lindsay gets an opportunity, all the dude does is perform. Yeah, I know he's on the smaller side for running backs. I get that. Let's talk about what's ahead of him. Mark Ingram, he's 147 years old. Uh, Rex Burkhead. Not with the Patriots, not interested. I wasn't interested when he was a Patriot. Uh, David Johnson, always hurt all the time. Last year, I know he had a couple good moments in the beginning of the season, and then a couple good moments at the end. But what happened in the middle? Oh, right, he got hurt. Now, yes, the Houston Texans are going to be an unmitigated disaster, probably in many, many ways. However, I think we also have to understand that even with bad teams, there comes some fantasy value. And there's a small chance, once again, with this free square, Philip Lindsay in these deeper drafts, that by the time we get to week one, Phil Lindsay could be the only running back standing, okay? He could be that last guy, and it might be his gig, and he is free. And Tags, you know, you might chuckle, but I've read some of your stuff on Phil Lindsay, and you kind of give him a little respect, don't you? I appreciate your boldness, my friend. I do like Philip Lindsay, the running back. However, I will not draft a single Texans player to my to my fantasy teams this year. This is like Adam Gase Jets type bad. This is bad. Oh, it's like, bad. Oh, it is bad. But that's what I'm saying. This is an upside show, damn it. This is where we find an every week starter. I don't think there's going to be an every week starter on the Texans. I there don't. will when David Johnson's on the on the IR and Mark Ingram is in his vacation house. Like That's what's going to happen. <laughs> And and somebody's gonna have to run the football there. And, I don't know. And, the, I, and I don't know what the Texans are. I don't know what the Texans are doing. If you look, and I know Andrew tracks all this stuff too. If you just sit down and you look at the additions and subtractions that have been taking place in that team this Gross. off season, it's mind blowing. Like I don't know what they're doing. It's like they're grabbing a bunch of random players that do not complement each other at all and just throwing them in and just saying, "Hey, we're gonna have a training camp battle. It's great, guys." <laughs> the coaching staff, nobody knows who they are. Like it's just this is like the replacements in the NFL, and it's not good. All right, well, we'll see if Shane Falco is available to show up in <laughs> camp and get to it. I showed my kids that movie this summer, and they loved The Replacement. They it was the, my daughters yeah. loved that movie, and then now it's on all the time on TBS, all the weekends. They're flipping around like, Dad, The Replacements is on. I'm like, awesome, let's sit down and watch the rest of it. It's a classic. All right, let's switch gears to some wide receivers and talk about some upside there. Again, this is upside. We're having some fun today. RB50, come on, Phil Lindsay. What, what, <laughs> cut him two weeks into the season. If We're talking to. upside. Let's talk Houston Texans. Come on. Well, look. Look, but upside also comes from just you're looking at opportunity and you're looking at free Dude, window. I like Philip Lindsay. You don't have to sell you me do. on him. I like. I know Philip you Lindsay do. And I wish he went to a better football team because the Broncos. I, I don't even want to get into it. He's good. 
thank you. That's all I need. I just need your verification. Oh, sorry. No. That's a bad word to say around here. Sorry. Tony, yeah, don't <laughs> let's, start. Let's get to the next part here. Let's talk about uh, wide receivers. Before we do, let's mention another sponsor of the show, and that is Pristine Auction. Tons of stuff for the man cave, for the she shed. Tons of stuff to enhance your NFL Sunday experience. You can decorate the entire house if you want with some of the great items over there on pristine auction everything is authentic you get the certification that tells you so so you know it's true because verified things are important and they mean more right tags also things are affordable there too it doesn't have to cost you hundreds or even thousands of dollars you can get things that are really kind of under 100 or even 50 bucks that are really cool and just kind of more personal for you as a sports fan but the only way you can do it is to register for free at pristineauction.com and when you do you get a five dollar credit on us just use that code fantasy pros again just put Fantasy Pros in the registration code and you get a free $5 credit. That's pristineauction.com, P-R-I-S-T-I-N-E, auction.com. Wide receiver time. Andrew Erickson, give me a name that you think is ready to maybe go from a two to a one or something in that range here. I'm going to go with Dallas Cowboys wide receiver, C.D. Lamb. I love C.D. Lamb this year just because of the upside that he showed with Dak Prescott during the four or five games that they played during the beginning of last year. Lamb led the team in receiving yards, receiving plays over 15 yards, yards per route run, all with Dak under center last year, 16.3 fantasy points per game at 12th best at the position. And the biggest thing that I noticed when kind of diving deeper into some of the numbers was Prescott was like locking in on Lamb in the red zone, like in the end zone. So he saw seven end zone targets from Dak Prescott or led the team in end zone targets. He saw seven deep balls from Dak Prescott, which was more than any Dallas wide receiver combined. Like, he was seeing targets downfield. He was seeing targets in the red zone. So, And those are the fantasy-friendly ones. So even if we see a more flat target rate, because it's hard to just project, okay, Lamb's going to see, like, a 25% target share, that's probably not going to happen just because Cooper's a good receiver. Gallup's a good receiver. Like, there's weapons in this offense. But his offense is going to score a ton of points. We all know that. It's an offense we want part of. And Lamb was such a good prospect coming in another year in the NFL. I just think that he could really be the number one wide receiver on this offense. And it's not to say that Cooper is a bad receiver in any way, shape or form. But if you look at just Cooper's career, besides 2018, when he kind of came into the Dallas Cowboys offense with a rookie, Michael Gallup, like he's always kind of been a more of a one, a one B type of receiver instead of being like, Oh, he's like established, like no doubt he's the number one. There's always been other guys like hanging around. Like it was Michael Crabtree with the Raiders, like lurking around. Like they were always kind of like one, two guys. And then, 2019 Michael Gallup was really productive alongside Amari Cooper so again I think that Lamb could just take that next step this year so I love him love him. he was my number one guy <laughs> and I've talked about him on this show so many times I figured I know Andrew well enough I'm gonna pick somebody else because I got a pretty good feeling Andrew is exactly where because we, we've done so many shows together over the years you and I and and work together obviously in, in the black book in the offseason so I, I could not agree more with you on CD Lamb tags I know you're kind of just as high as we are, I believe, on C.D. Lamb, too. He's still being drafted as a wide receiver, too, but I am very confident if I go running back heavy early in a draft, if he's my one, I feel okay about that. Like, I can back that up right away with another wide receiver, but it feels like there's a couple guys, Julio Jones is one and C.D. Lamb is the other, where they're kind of not valued as ones, but I value them as a one. Do you see Lamb in that same light, Tex? Number one, Andrew, I agree. CD Lamb. He was actually the second name I put on my list in case I had to. I feel like there's a giant butt else... coming here. Number two. Ugh. How dare you? I know. I know. Do Amari not Cooper's talk down Amari Cooper. No. Okay. Amari Cooper is that dude, and he makes life easier on everybody else around him. So the reason that CD Lamb is as efficient as he is with his targets is because he played like 90% of his snaps in the slot uh, last year, and that was with Dak. Um, they kind of eased him in, and it was like honestly the best thing for him coming from Oklahoma. It wasn't the best of competition, and that was what I was worried about with CD Lamb coming into the pros. Was like, okay, there's going to be a big change in the competition, but with Gallup and Cooper there, they were able to play him in the slot all the time. Which, I mean. CD Lamb against nickel corners, safeties, linebackers sometimes. Come on. That's just, it's a mismatch. And they're going to continue to use him like that. Now they're talking about using him more on the perimeter this year, like mixing and matching things. They might have to. Uh, the reason that I'm moving CD Lamb up my boards a little bit by a little bit is because Amari Cooper is still dealing with a foot ankle injury. Mm-hmm. And that's that's problematic for, for pass catchers. So uh, he did have a, a, a procedure, uh, I think it was back in January, if I'm not mistaken, um, which is still the same calendar year, which is t- when I usually tend to downgrade players. So that could definitely impact for CeeDee Lamb being of like, you know, a Chris Godwin, Calvin Ridley, next step in line, CeeDee Lamb type breakout. Uh, I could definitely see that. But the player I put on my list uh, right in front of him was A.J. Brown. 
AJ Brown, I know he's not going in wide receiver two territory, but he's coming. He's come down to earth ever since they they brought in Julio Jones. They, he's kind of fallen to around wide receiver ten to wide receiver twelve. That's where I typically see him go in drafts. And I'm this guy has a legit shot of finishing as the wide receiver one in fantasy football. Uh, a lot of people talk about. I don't think the offense is going to allow it. There's not going to be enough pass attempts. This is not Arthur Smith's offense anymore. He's no longer with the team. You know, when you have players in your team like Julio Jones, you add Julio Jones to your team, you're going to throw the ball more. Derrick Henry, people talk about the fact that running backs coming off a nearly 400 touch season are traditional, like they're just typically injured. And people are building that into Derrick Henry's wrist this year, which is why they're not taking him at, you know, number three overall sometimes. So, you know, when you factor all this stuff in, it's just AJ Brown is a freak. And now adding Julio opposing defenses it's almost like a ridley julio thing where they have to pick and choose their battles and what are you going to do you know are you going to leave julio jones in man coverage are you going to leave aj brown in man coverage like good luck you know um it's just going to force teams to do that so is it possible that julio jones serves as more of a i don't want to say like a I don't want to say that he's just left out altogether, that he's just basically pulling attention away from A.J. Brown, because I don't think that's going to happen. But I think it's a give and take here. And we saw Calvin Ridley last year basically have a top five season with Julio Jones in the lineup for half the year. So A.J. Brown continues to ascend. I mean, I have him as my number six wide receiver. I could see him finishing number one. I have him as five. Uh, So I love this because you and I see this the same. We didn't see Julio going there as all that much of a negative. In fact, in a lot of ways, you get the knowledge First of all, and I think no one's talking about that enough, is you get Julio Jones, one of the best to ever play this position, talking to the young man here about all those little things that you could do better. And that is one of those intangible qualities that, you know, to pick a brain from a Hall of Famer, right? <laughs> that's well, that that's his idol, player. too. That's that's right, AJ that's Brown's his idol. And that's what he actually offered to give Julio the number 11 because of respect. And mm-hmm. Julio said, no, no, dude, that's yours now. Um, so... I love the respect between those two. And yes, he is going to help AJ Brown grow as a receiver. They're different players in a lot of ways, but Brown is, I mean, he, nothing bad is going to come from getting tutelage of of Julio Jones. Just ask Calvin Ridley. No, we're, uh, we're we're big fans of AJ Brown over at PFF. (laughs) Huge fans of AJ Brown. And the thing that I noticed about him too, when the Julio Jones trade, you know, first came happened was it's just the efficiency of the offense is just going to increase all together like he's Mm -hmm. Julio Jones is the the tide that lifts all the boats of the offense and Mm -hmm. there was no other stat that depicted that better was Calvin Ridley perfect passer rating versus man coverage when Julio Jones was on the field last year so again it's going to be yeah AJ Brown may not have a 12 target game but he's only going to need four targets for like 200 yards because that's what he's going to do like they're just going to be what's been his moniker Andrew this entire career is efficiency my goodness he's so efficient can he keep up the efficiency uh, well, yeah, yeah, he can. So that, I mean, I love that. And I knew there was a good chance AJ Brown was going to be the other guy I talked about here first. So I didn't pick him either, but I am, I'm with you guys. Like those are two of my, those are going be the two guys on my list. So I went to a third based on yesterday's show's conversation, which really kind of stirred me and thinking, and this is what I, I love working with such smart people in the industry every day, because they always say like steel sharpen steel, right? Like this is one of those kind of moments. And yesterday, Yates brought up a really good point, which is how many touchdowns do we think Matt Stafford's going to throw? We all said, well, at least 30, right? Well, then why don't we like Robert Woods more? And I think we start to look at the opportunity here, especially now that Cam Akers is out. And now maybe we do have to force a little bit more through the air, which is not going to be a problem for Matthew Stafford and McVay. That might be exactly what they want to do anyway, for all we know. He's wide receiver 19 right now. And there's every opportunity that Robert Woods could finish somewhere around 11 or 12. I, just in this offense with the opportunity with the improved quarterback play. So I'm not going to go too much further on that, but I think that, you know, I was somebody that liked Woods but didn't love him, but now I'm starting to look at this board, and now that Michael Thomas is off this board, this bumps him up on, again for me, another spot at least. And I'm looking at Fitzpatrick and McLaurin and everyone talking about that, but maybe we're not talking enough about Matthew Stafford and Robert Woods tags. What do you think? I mean, Robert Woods has never been a big time touchdown scorer. That's the that's the concern with him because He's also in order played to with Jared Goff, well, <laughs> the last yeah, I mean, years. <laughs> he, he, I mean, he, I mean, you go back to the Buffalo days. He played with Fitzpatrick. He played with Tyrod. He played with Goff, obviously. But some players like Sammy Watkins has scored touchdowns with Jared Goff. Cooper Cup has scored double digit touchdowns with Jared Goff. So, I just don't think that Woods is like that giant red zone threat. Uh, now, the fact that they 
lost Cam Akers, does that open up passing a little bit more in the red zone? Probably. Um, so I, I mean, I have Woods as wide receiver 17, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I'm not, I'm definitely not down on Woods, but I happen to think that Cup might be the better choice here because mm-hmm. I think Woods is going to be a solid wide receiver too. Like that much I know. Cooper Cup has a legit shot to finish as a top 10 wide receiver because Cooper Cup has been fantastic in the red zone. They move him all over the formation as well. And he's just a younger guy on the come up where Robert Woods is actually starting to get up there in age a little bit. Um, and I wonder if they design the playbook around Robert Woods because of Jared Goff's limitations. So mm, that's the part where I think that Cooper Cup is more of the upside play, whereas Robert Woods is more of the safe play. Well, this is the upside show, baby. So that's why I'm bringing the upside guy. See, my problem with Cooper Cup is the injuries the last couple of years, too which is something when nobody seems to want to ever talk about with him, the time missed and all the injuries he's had. And I like Cooper Cup, the talent. In fact, I was one of the guys who was much higher on him earlier in his career than a lot of other folks. And now that value, once again, we're getting these guys kind of all in the same ADP. All right, before we go on to the next six wide receivers on our list, we got six more to talk about. I want to tell you about Air MedCare Network because we got to talk about what the best defense is for the unexpected and whether or not you're prepared if the unthinkable happens. If a medical emergency arises, Air MedCare Network provides members with world-class emergency air transport services to the nearest hospital with no out-of-pocket expenses. Join today and never pay a dime for your medical flight when flown by an AMCN provider. Insurance doesn't always cover the full cost of a medical emergency, so this is a great way to secure financial peace of mind. And memberships cost as little as $85 a year for your entire household. And right now, as a Fantasy Pros listener, you'll get a $50 Visa or Amazon gift card with a membership. All you got to do is go to airmedcarenetwork.com, again, slash Fantasy Pros. That's airmedcarenetwork.com forward slash Fantasy Pros. Use the offer code Fantasy Pros, all one word. And there you go. You can go ahead and get your membership. No matter where you are in the game of life, Air MedCare Network membership is the protection you need and you can't live without. Andrew Erickson, who is a wide receiver you can't live without? Maybe somebody a little deeper now into the pool. Maybe a three who could become a two that's being undervalued. Who's the next name on your list? All right. So before I get into my next name on my list, I want to bring us back to 2019. Curtis Samuel, Air Yards monster. Literally, there was not a pass thrown within his general vicinity that he could have caught. Like, it just was not possible. He And it was a disappointing for everybody. We were all disappointed because the opportunity was there for Curtis Samuel to deliver fantasy football performances, but the quarterback play held him back. 2020, we move forward. He has Teddy Bridgewater, the super accurate quarterback. And what do you know? Curtis Samuel finishes the top 25 wide receiver. We're all great. He went from 79th in terms of catchable targets to first. Like, number one in the NFL last year was Curtis Samuel. So that brings us to our player for 2021, Jerry Judy. Mm-hmm. Last year, seventh in total air yards for a rookie is is insane. Like, to see that type of opportunity in offense, it, it shows you that he's a good player. Like, players earn opportunities. It's not just, oh, well, we didn't know what else we were doing. It's like, no, he's a first-round pick. The talent's there. 59% of his targets were deemed catchable last year, which was third worst in the NFL. Like, again, the drops didn't help with Jerry Judy, but... A lot of the studies on drops are they're not really sticky. Again, you have to get open to drop the football. Like, that's the more important thing. If Nikhil Harry dropped more passes, I would be thrilled. I would be, <laughs> I would be thrilled. But he doesn't because he never gets open. That's the big issue. So, for me, Jerry <sighs> Judy, especially if, if Teddy Bridgewater takes over that quarterback mm-hmm. role, I, I think we could totally see Jerry Judy just explode in year two. I really like Cortland Sutton a lot, but at the same time, like when I'm looking at the values, like Cortland Sutton in round six, Jerry Judy in round seven, it's like I can't ignore the value with Judy just going a little bit later where he probably fits better stylistically with a Teddy Bridgewater than a Cortland Sutton. And again, like I love Cortland Sutton. Like I'm one of the biggest guys on him, but even I can admit like Judy is really hard to pass up on on a better value with probably a better quarterback fit if it is Bridgewater, which I think it will be. I have a ton of rosters with Jerry Judy as the wide receiver three so far in early drafts tags. And you and I share a lot of rosters. We talk about this stuff all the time. You know, just because we're not doing the show, it doesn't matter. Like, it's like 10 o'clock at night. Tags is sending us a roster of something he just drafted. I'm sending him one of mine. Yeah. We're talking about it. We pick it apart and all that stuff. This is what we do. We're sick. This is, a, this is a problem. This is what we do. But you and I are very big on Jerry Judy for a lot of the reasons Andrew just said. And, and I'm very glad we're getting to talk about him again today because I want to drive it home. 
it's the value more than anything right now and the upside. And if there is an upside guy in the wide receiver category, man, this guy's got a big red circle around him for me, Tex. Oh, yeah, he's definitely the one I had on my list uh, that I wanted to talk about is because you're able to get him as a wide receiver four right now. You know, uh, Mike Williams, we talk about, he's actually going into like wide receiver five territory a lot of times. Uh, But Jerry Judy, from everything we're hearing. So this is, as you mentioned, Andrew, this is one of those things I've been paying attention to is is to is to who's going to win that quarterback battle between Drew Locke and Teddy Bridgewater based on everything I've heard coming out of Denver's camp. They're saying Bridgewater is outshining him all day. I think they wanted Locke to win that job, but if it's apparent, they have to go with Bridgewater. Um, so Bridgewater, if he takes over as a starter, he's a more timing base. He's more someone that's going to recognize when someone's open. Whereas, you know, Drew Locke is someone that has tunnel vision. He doesn't, he, he Jerry Judy gets open nonstop and it Drew Locke just doesn't see him because he doesn't scan the entire field. He's just not a good quarterback. And it sucks that he didn't develop the way that I think we hoped because Drew Locke seems like a fun dude. Um, but Jerry Judy, the talent is there. Uh, I I've said uh, when he, right when he walked into the league, Jerry Judy was a top 10 route runner. And I stand mm-hmm. by that. Uh, I understand last year didn't net the results that people wanted, but the dude is uber talented. And, you know, just seeing Teddy Bridgewater last year, you know, despite not throwing many touchdowns, he supported three top 26 wide receivers, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so he obviously can do that with Cortland Sutton and Judy. But so it just depends on who wins the quarterback battle, because I I think Sutton's better with Drew Locke, because, again, tunnel vision, willing to throw it in contested coverage, uh, whereas Teddy Bridgewater, a little bit more timing based, a little he's going to throw to the open guy, scans the field a little bit better. So it just depends. But I love it. I love it. That's where I'm with you, Andrew. Was that actually the name you had next to That was about? the name I had down. I debated Devontae Smith um, as someone that I would have I'd put in this kind of conversation as well. I, I could talk about either of the Bengals wide receivers because... The- well, that's okay. I'll do it. Let me do. do it. No, no. Let me do that for you, Tex. <laughs> Let me bring up my guy. Wide receiver 29, T. Higgins. Now... Yep. I know when the season ended, Andrew and I, I believe we did a show, we talked about guys, you know, we always try to target people that we think are going to make that jump. We talked about it. And when the season closed, Andrew and I talked about this on air. It was CeeDee Lamb and it was T. Higgins. And then Jamar Chase came into the picture and we all went, ooh, ow. It was very, uh, very Peter Griffin on Family Guy. We just sat on the sidewalk and I sat there long enough, ooing and eyeing over the pain of the Jamar Chase. And now I'm starting to get over it and realize This defense is terrible. There's enough here to go around. I like Jamar Chase too. I'm happy taking either one of those guys, Mm -hmm. as Tags was kind of saying, and they're both kind of back-to-back, 29-30, 28-29, depends on where you are, but they are within five picks of each other, typically in most drafts that I've seen and most ADP and the ADP you can see on Fantasy Pros. I'm not going to give up on the talent of T. Higgins. I'm not going to give up what I saw when he took over in week three. I've talked about this before in the show. He was outstanding all the way through that run when Joe Burrow then eventually got hurt. We know the rest of the story, but I want to go back to the consistency level of T Higgins, which is what I love. And I still think in this offense, you're going to see a fair amount of consistency from T Higgins, even with Jamar chase. And it almost kind of becomes like a, like the wish.com version of AJ Brown and Julio Jones, where we just order, you know, we save a couple bucks and we go down a little bit because this duo might be kind of the poor man's version of that. And in a lot of ways, they're cheaper. So if you don't get those guys and you went RB heavy or you did take the big quarterback, the Bengals wide receivers, I feel like, are somewhere to make that up, Tags. No, no, I, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, even if you go back to when Burrow was starting during the, the first half of the season, AJ, or AJ Green was, I think, top. Uh, he may have been the top in the league in terms of air yards during that time. And T. Higgins didn't even start till week three. And T. Mm-hmm. Higgins was from the time that he took over as a full-time starter to the time Burrow got hurt, T Higgins was like the wide receiver 13, if I'm not mistaken in fantasy yeah. football. So he was a borderline wide receiver one already. That's where the, the weird thing comes in where I don't know which way to go here um, mm-hmm. because T Higgins has proven that he can do it in the NFL. And it's an important question that I think we need to discuss because people are going to be forced with that decision. Do you want T Higgins or do you want Jamar chase T Higgins proved last year? You could play in the NFL on short notice with no preseason with no time to develop any chemistry with Joe Burrow. That happened right away. Jamar Chase took a year off football. You know, mm-hmm. that that's a real thing. Um, he's a young kid, obviously. But you go back to LSU and him and Joe Burrow have chemistry. They set records together. So it's like, where do we go here? Because people would have said Jamar Chase was the far super, superior prospect to he, T. Higgins. And that's nothing against Higgins. Higgins was a good prospect. There's a reason he was drafted at the top of the second round. But... We're talking about Jamar Chase, a guy that that mm-hmm. Joe Burrow just told people. Like he told the front office and said, "Hey, take him at number five overall. I don't want an offensive tackle. I want that guy." So obviously he's going to want to throw him the football. So I'm torn on it, man. I, I I did put Jamar Chase one spot higher than T Higgins, but I can make the case where Higgins should probably be higher than him because we've already seen it. But again, 
The guy throwing them the football wanted Jamar Chase. This is why you play salary cap league. So you can go get both of these guys and you could fade the top of wide receiver a little bit and get these guys. Or, or I'll tell you what, man, I am not against this. You know, you're at a turn and they're both there and you need two wide receivers. I'm fine. I'll take well, both of those guys. No, it's true because like if you take both of them in an auction, I promise you that either, it's either they're both going to be wide receiver threes or one is going to be like right. a, ding, a borderline ding, ding. wide receiver one and another one's still going to be a wide receiver three. So you're getting value here. I think Tyler Boyd's the odd man out though. He's the yeah. one that I'm, I've usually been a Tyler Boyd guy where it's like getting him as wide, wide receiver three, absolutely. But I think that his consistent targets are going to slowly come to an end with these They two. have to. They, they, he's not in the same class as the other two guys. Yeah. It's just not the point. And there's going to be enough to go around. All right. Last name here, let's go deep. Maybe a wide receiver five, a dart throw guy, super deep leagues. Erickson, take us home here. Give us the last guy on your upside list. Well, I was going to mention a, a Texans player, but I'm, I'm afraid. No, Mike, don't you dare. I'm afraid Ear Mike muffs. might hurt Ear me. Let me talk you out of it. Muffs. <laughs> Mike might hurt me from it. So I'll just, no, I'll, no, I'll just. You mention him. You mention I'll, whoever you want. I'll don't mention him briefly. Him. Just okay. he's a rookie. So Nico Collins, uh, the rookie wide receiver that the Texans drafted in the third round. They traded up to get him. And again, just looking for opportunities in an offense. Like there, there's so many, again, tags mentioned, like they're just a hodgepodge of wide receivers. They have a receiver named Alex Erickson. He's my long lost brother on Houston Texans. <laughs> yeah. I actually, <laughs> I actually, I actually called you his name one time mistakenly. It's yeah. So they just have a bunch of receivers that we don't really know what's going to happen. And Nico Collins, again, interesting prospect, a big six foot four wide receiver. So he's a different archetype than Brandon Cooks. So if Tyrod Taylor or Davis Mills favors a big contested catch wide receiver, again, if he's going to be seeing inaccurate targets, he's got that down, you know, second in contested catch rate from 2018 to 2019 from Michigan. His biggest thing issue coming out was like separation. So getting some Nikhil Harry vibes. Sorry, Nikhil. I, I don't mean to keep, you know, dumping on you, but his okay. athletic, this is a safe place, Andrew. his athletic testing was impressive. Like it was a lot more impressive than I thought it was going to be. So that did kind of heighten my interest in him a little bit. So Nico Collins is just one guy I wanted to mention. Again, he's like one of my highest owned best ball wide receivers because you can get him in like super, super late. And then the other player I just think is really undervalued across the board is Sterling Shepard. Again, mm -hmm. and I know the first thing people think is like, oh, like he's not upside player. Like he just gets like slot <laughs> targets. But at the same time, like he gets, he's averaged eight targets per game over the past two seasons. Like you need targets to score fantasy points. Like that's the biggest thing. It's the same thing with like a Cole Beasley. It's like, Yes, like they don't look sexy, but then when you actually look at the box number and look at the production, like, oh, wow, like he was like a wide receiver three and like actually had big weeks because he's getting targets, like he's getting involved in the offense. And to finish 2020, Sterling Shepard had two top 12 finishes in PPR. So again, there is some upside with him because he gets volume in the offenses that he's played with, whether it's been Eli Manning, whether it's been Daniel Jones. And when it's been Daniel Jones, Shepard has averaged 16 fantasy points per game. And he's been the leader in target rate per route run with Daniel Jones on her center. So, again, Galladay is, hasn't really been, like, this target hog most of his career. Like, he's obviously the number one. But Evan Ingram, like, is he going to lead the team targets again? Like, Darius Slayton? Like, those guys are not as no. trustworthy as Sterling Shepard, who I think is just locked and loaded. Like, people talk about how, oh, Jarvis Landry is a value. No, Sterling Shepard is a value. Like, mm -hmm. he's a guy that you can get so late that's going to get – I think he has a streak of like six targets per game going back to like 2018. Like, yep, I was no going to say six plus targets in 26 <laughs> of his last 28 games. I'm glad you mentioned him, Andrew, because yeah. in a lot of the best, like I'm in a best ball right now for the uh, five yard rush charity. And, you know, you see these names, they keep lasting and they keep going. And Shepard, I think, is one of them. He was one I actually contemplated. And right now he is wide receiver 65 uh, over in there in half point PPR ADP right now. And that's. I mean, he's going after Rondell Moore, but before Gabriel Davis. Now, for me, I'm a Davis guy, so I'd probably go that route with Josh Allen over Daniel Jones. But still, I mean, Sterling Shepard, definitely a guy I think that whether you're talking about late upside targets in your draft or on your bench, why not? You know, just for just for the volume alone, potentially. Tags, who's the last name on your list you want to hit? I mean, I can talk about Mike Williams again. We're not going to do that. No, um, no, no. But Enough no, no I mean, I'm just driving it home. Do you I like Mike people. Williams? I'm not sure. Sometimes. Okay. Um, but I will say, I mean, we, we had the show yesterday that we obviously talked about the late round uh, dart throws, the guys mm -hmm. that are being drafted outside the top 120. So Rashad Bateman, uh, Jacoby Myers, Darnell Mooney, those are guys that I'm targeting. Um, I think Bateman is my, 
I'll say I'll say he's probably my favorite just because I'm getting a lot of Justin Jefferson vibes from him hmm. in term in terms of you know how we feel about him and the things that we said about Justin Jefferson last year and and, and like the, the offense he plays in and um, but Lamar Jackson's been efficient as a passer a lot more efficient than people I think realize so if they do take a step forward and actually throw the ball a little bit more a la the Bills in 2020 we could see a player that has a breakout season and you're getting him legitimately with like your final pick maybe you might have to get him like the 14th round or something like that but that's the best part is that if it doesn't work out you just kind of say hey I, I, I shot for the ceiling here and it didn't happen I could let him go and pick up the waiver wire guy yeah and look man I, I think that the comparison is very interesting because my goodness what kind of upside Justin Jefferson had I mean that was a league winner right there I mean that was a difference maker guy and you know Lamar Jackson in college was pretty good in the pocket the problem is the Ra- the uh, the Ravens offensive line has not been great in pass protection they've been a run offensive line and great there because that's been the identity so finding that balance will be fascinating to watch but certainly Bateman's one of those guys everyone's heard me talk about Mooney already and talk about Davis already so I'm going to pick out another guy even deeper let's go all the way bottom into the shelf and it's actually a guy that I know my colleagues here love and you know what I do too now uh they've they've gotten into my head he's wide receiver 110 about Dwayne Eskridge in the deeper leagues and the problem is the Seattle Seahawks really don't attack the middle of the field very well. It's why you kind of see Chris Carson starting to catch more balls and do what he did last year. And yeah, maybe the addition of another tight end will, will change that. Maybe, you know, he's that guy now. But I, for me, if you start to see those three wide receiver sets showing up there in preseason for the Seahawks, just kind of circle that, make a note of it into your drafts, especially in this is the deeper leagues. This is, again, Dynasty Leagues, Eskridge is already kind of on people's radars. But even in the deeper leagues, you're playing in a 14-team league or something like that, you're going to need a lot of depth. And this is a guy that has that upside because I think the one thing that Seattle really is just has been failing to do is to get the middle of the field a little bit back in the offense. And I think Eskridge is a guy in the slot who can make that happen. And Tags, I know how much you love guys in the slot. And I just don't know if Gerald Everett think is actually that guy. To be fair, I don't think he's going to play the slot. I think he'll you don't be think a perimeter. So? No, you Tyler, think Lockett, Lockett Tyler Lockett's their slot receiver. Um, the guy that... But I, I actually think that Eskridge... Eskridge is a perimeter player right now. Like, basically, he has a limited route tree, um, but he can win in press coverage, which is something you need on the perimeter. He's really good with that. He could stretch the field, kind of like DK, in a way. But... Um, I actually think Cade Johnson, if you want to go deeper down their depth chart, Cade Johnson is a guy that reminded me a little bit of Tyler Lockett when scouting him. Uh, he went undrafted due to some, uh, some medical testing, but apparently everything is checked out. Um, but Cade Johnson is a, is a name to watch in dynasty. If, if like, if you're listening to this and you're just like, Cade Johnson, I never heard of him. Put him on the end of your dynasty <laughs> roster. And, and, and if something happens to Tyler Lockett, I believe he would step into that role. Yeah. And, and look, Tyler Lockett's had a good career, but I don't know. After last year, I've really soured on Tyra Lockett. He's just know. inconsistent. He's a very boom and bust receiver. You have to accept it. It's, it was almost like Will Fuller pre-2020. Yeah, but at least Will Fuller would catch a touchdown every week. This guy would catch three. <laughs> you know, it's true, though. I mean, Will Fuller would do nothing. He'd have two catches. It's like that Mike Evans line you see sometimes yeah. from last year. Where like, oh my God, look at it. Where did this come from? Oh, two catches or three catches and a touchdown. Tyra Lockett was 0-0-0 zero, 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 then... 60 you know that that doesn't work for me like uh, that's that's not going to help you on a weekly basis what will help you is following andrew erickson though at andrew erickson underscore on twitter checking out all his work and a pro football focus he does great content over there whether it be podcasts i know he does some radio work for them too he does a ton of writing and of course his profiles in the black book for the running back uh, position are just spectacular fantastic stuff so happy you were able to jump in with us today and take some time in your very busy schedule being a brilliant young man Erickson, what else you got going on right now, my friend? Well, I just wanted to shout out Tags for the the K Johnson call. If he hadn't done that, I was gonna that was the first thing I was gonna say. Just mention <laughs> K Johnson because I liked K Johnson more than Eskridge. Like during oh. the pre draft process, and right, everybody doesn't like my pick. I get it. It's <laughs> not. I like look, Eskridge. Though. All I'm saying is their profiles are pretty similar. Like they're both yak guys, so I, you understand where they would work in the offense. You have the safeties are playing back against the deep ball. That was the problem with the Seahawks last year. They didn't have any guys to work underneath. Like David Moore was like a, a vertical receiver. So they needed, so that's why they got Everett and why they got two yak receivers like an Eskridge and like a K Johnson. And the thing with K Johnson was, look, he only, I think you mentioned why he went undrafted, but again, he also didn't play last year because his mm. season got canceled because he went to freaking South Dakota state. So <laughs> they didn't have a season for him to play football. And if there's any team, that will willingly throw draft capital out the window. Yep. It's, Pete, it's Pete Carroll and the Seattle Seahawks. Like, they don't care. Like, oh, Matt yep. Flynn? Oh, don't, no, Russell Wilson, you're going to start. Yep. Oh, uh, Chris Carson, seventh-round pick. Rashad, all right, you're Chris right. Carson, you're playing. Yep. Uh, guys, remember Gary Jennings? 
fourth round pick <laughs> never played. Wow. So it's true. That's why Kay Johnson is definitely super interesting. And this is why I love you. I asked you to plug what you've got going on and you just want to give more knowledge to everybody. <laughs> You're just like the giving tree for God's sakes. I love it. Uh, obviously, uh, make sure you check out all of our sponsors as well. Air Medcare Network. Again, go to Air Medcare Network. Uh, forward slash, uh, excuse me, AaronMedCareNetwork.com forward slash fantasy pros. Again, the protection that you sometimes can't live without. Also, make sure you check out Pristine Auction. Again, some of the coolest stuff out there, PristineAuction.com. That's P R I S T I N E auction.com. $5 credit when you register for free with the code fantasy pros. And you might get a Josh Allen jersey if you move your league over to Fantrax. Go to Fantrax.com slash Fantasy Pros to sign up. You get entered to win that Josh Allen jersey, and you get to play out your fantasy season on the absolute most customizable platform in the history of the universe for fantasy football. And don't forget about the Draft Wizard Draft Assistant. Go to FantasyPros.com slash Draft Wizard. Again, I can't stress this enough. We use it here when we do our drafts. And if you upgrade to that MVP Hall of Fame subscription over at Fantasy Pros, you can use it for yours. It's a difference maker. You listen to these shows because you love fantasy football. So you're making investment in time, which costs more than anything. But this is an investment you should make as well for all of your leagues and get that foundation built properly in all of your drafts. That'll do it for us. But the story of the game goes on. For Andrew Erickson and Tags, I'm Joey P. We'll see you next time, kids. Thanks for tuning in to the Fantasy Pros YouTube channel. Don't forget to check out our featured videos. And while you're at it, make sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Fantasy Pros so you can get the latest news and updates to give you the edge you need in your fantasy league.